Hey, what's up, guys? Uh, welcome to the show. Uh, if you have not been here before, uh, this is uh, You Down MMT, and I've been doing a series of chapter reads of the book you see on, on your screen right there, uh, Macroeconomics from an MMT standpoint. And today I'm going to be doing uh, chapter 13, The Theory of Effective Demand. Uh, let's see, so 13.1 because these goes into 13s, 10s, you know, that sort of thing, you know, something like 1.1 or something to that effect. Anyway, uh, introduction in the previous two chapters, we examined the oft repeated claim among economists that market forces push the economy toward an equilibrium at which supply equals demand. This view is often supported by the common sense argument that. So long as prices are flexible, then they will adjust to an equilibrium level at which the quantity offered for sale just matches the quantity demanded. That equilibrium price is said to be the price that clears the market. We saw in Chapter 12 that while this type of economic theor theorizing remains influential, it is deeply flawed. It turns out that the simple analogy based on a weekend farmer's market, as made in, in Chapter 1, and the guidance of an invisible hand cannot be simply uh, scaled up to an, into an econo the economy, excuse me, as a result or as a whole in which there are numerous uh, inter interdependent markets. Stay tuned for more. Hey, welcome back. Uh, if you don't know, uh, this is uh, you down with MMT, and right now I am doing a uh, chapter by chapter reading of the book you see on the screen. And if you're listening to this, uh, it's Macroeconomics from an MMT standpoint, basically, it's by William or Bill Mitchell, Bill Randall Ray, and Martin Watts. Which Martin Watts, I'm not, uh, Martin Watts, I'm not familiarized with him, still need to familiarize with him, but anyway, so. I'm on 194 page. Uh, the proposition that under flexible price uh, markets clear was reinforced by Say's law that support that supply creates its own demand. The argument will all uh, the, the, the argument damn uh, the argument that all income generated from production do, did not need to be spent in the same period when it was rejected by classical e economist who invoked uh, loanable funds theory. In turn, Keynes challenged the uh, explicit assumption of loanable funds, a theory that households' decisions to save signaled to firms the intention to engage in higher consumption at some time in the future, which justified firms borrowing funds for investment to provide the, the capacity to meet these anticipated future demands. For an, for an economy uh, to maintain full employment, there, when there is a shift in consumption that are like this, firms would have to know exactly when the future consumption spending would occur and the configuration of the goods and services that this future consumption spending might take. If they have the information, then the resources released from the production of consumption goods now could be just uh, redeployed to the production of investment go investment goods for future production of consumer or consumption goods and services. However, households save in the form of, help, of holding money and other liquid assets, which in practice is revealed to, firm, uh, to firms only when the, they notice that they have unsold inventory. If they hadn't anticipated the saving, they might respond by reducing production and laying off workers and delaying new investment plans. The economy overall then enters a slump. In response to classical theory, Keynes argued that it is the expectation of sales that motivates current production and income generation. Thus, capitalists hire the number of workers they need, think they will need to produce and uh, the amount of output they need or they think they can sell. 
uh, for Keynes, this is an alternative and better de definition of equilibrium. Rather than arguing that market forces push uh, towards market clearing, Keynes said they instead settle at a equilibrium which firms produce what they think they can sell at a profit. The different uh, the difference might seem subtle, uh, uh, but it is important. Uh, in Keynes' view, the existence of idle resources, including in particular unemployed labor, will not be resolved through the pr price system, even if unemployed workers could bid down wages. This would not increase employment if employers do not believe they can t sell more output. Recognizing the fall, uh, falling wages in the face of unemployment would reduce the income that would that could be spent on consumption. Keynes argued that flexible wages might only make matters worse. Assume the employers are uh, pessimistic about sales, so they reduce the scale of production. Also assume that as employment uh, uh, unemployment uh, rises, Wages are bid down in the way conceived by, classless, by the classical system as outlined in Chapter 11. Reduce employment and lower wages and, perha or, and perhaps reduce working hours for those who do not lose their jobs combined to lower the wage income all household, uh, of all uh, income of households. With reduced income, workers can cut back on consumption. Firms respond with, respond with further layoffs and further reductions in wages and hours. You can see how a vicious cycle might result, with wage and price flexibility only fueling the downturn. For example, one only needs to look at the dynamics of the Great Depression in the 1930s when falling wages were associated with falling employment. Keynes did not rely solely on such evidence in support of his argument. He developed an alternative framework for an analysis of the macroeconomic deter uh, determination of the e economy's equilibrium position. In doing so, in doing so, he abandoned the supply equals demand approach of mo most economies, uh, economists, and instead developed a model of effective demand known as the D through Z approach. And the, the theory of effective demand, which shows that the macro, macroeconomy can be uh, in equilibrium at less than full employment. This is the centerpiece of Keynes' de demolition of the classical macroeconomics model and is, in, and is an, as applicable today as it was in 1936 when, uh, when he published the, gen the general theory. Now we're on 13.2, the D through Z approach to effective demand. The main problem with the market-based approach to equilibrium is that it is a fundamentally a micro-based theory and fails when it is, when it applied when it is, when it is applied to the economy overall. When we draw a, su a supply curve for widgets, that is. Any produced good, we pre we presume that it is independent of the demand curve for widgets, as well as as well as of demand and supply curve associated with other markets. This independence of the two uh, two sides of the market is a base is a base, basic assumption of orthodox macroeconomics, and is essentially or essential for markets to clear when price adjusted to excess demand at ex uh, at excess supply. Let's go back to the farmer's market again and think about the bananas. If we are an now analyzing the market for bananas at, at a, on a Sunday at 1659, with the closing time of 1700, these assumptions might be reasonable. I had no idea what the 16, what the, what time the actual 1659 and 700, 1700 would be, but anyway. With one minute left to clear the market, we could imagine that suppliers will offer lower prices and demanders might raise bids to the point where the demand meets supply. After all, unsold bananas would spoil quickly and sellers would be stuck with them if they didn't lower prices. 
with who while those who wanted bananas for dessert that evening would miss out if they didn't offer a higher bid these compa compatible objectives ensure a convergence at some markets clearing price in the final minute of the market uh, the market day we could safely ignore any possible effects of demand on the supply on the supply curve high or low demand would not affect the quantity of bananas at the market because the available banana supply has already been set. The same is true at the fish stand next door. The supply is fixed for the day. It is too late for the banana growers to go back to their farm to harvest more fruit and too late for the fishers to either launch more fishing boats or to cut back on fishing. Further, we can ignore impacts on other markets. If the equilibrium price of fish falls lower, uh, the income of, fish, of fishers, this is not going to be significantly affected. The effects uh, it's not going to significantly affect their demand for products at the market, since they've already largely completed their own purchases. And finally, it is too late for suppliers of bananas to switch careers to become fishermen to take advantage. <coughs> Excuse me fishermen to take advantage of that uh, of that weekend's brisker uh, brisker sales of fish then of bananas however in general we cannot jump to such conclusions uh if we are talking about the operation of the economy as a whole over long periods of time here we have an example of the fallacy of composition if over the course of a year, the supply of bananas exceeds the demand, falling prices for bananas will have a, a wider effects. For the income of bananas growers falls, uh, wait a minute. Yeah. Uh, lo lowering their own consumption. Some switch professions, because perhaps pushing wage lower in those jobs. <clears throat> If the low demand for bananas results in the switch to, say, mango production jobs and profits may be more plentiful in that sector. On the other hand, if the, reduc the reduction of banana consumption does not show up as increased consumption elsewhere, the economy as a whole suffers from lower demand and employment. Keynes realized that if we are analyzing the economy as a whole, we cannot simply aggregate up from individual market, presuming that each is independent. Further, he understood that we cannot presume that the aggregate supply curve is uh, independent from, uh, from the aggregate demand curve. Firms will only supply output for which they think there is a demand. For that reason, Keynes needed a completely new framework for an analysis. He proposed to use a D, uh, or aggregate demand, and Z, aggregate supply curves. These are not the usual demand and supply curves for that you see in macroeconomic textbooks, which plot quantity against price. That would not be appropriate for aggregate demand and supply, which includes a wide variety of hetero heterogeneous output sold in different markets. We cannot simply add up quantities across a variety of types of goods and services to get a Q that stands for quantity. Instead, Keynes proposed to use variables appropriate to aggregate analysis. He argued in Chapter 4 of his general theory that there are only two units of measurement which are consistent with macroeconomic analysis, money units and hours of labor input. We can, for, in, for, we can, for instance, measure output in terms of either the total money value or in terms of the number of hours of labor, uh, labor required to produce it. The first is quite straightforward and is the way that we measure GDP today. Whether we are summing up the value of the output of computers, automobiles, lumber, or haircuts, we can use the currency value of the final output in each sector. As we discussed in Chapter 4, comparing levels of GDP over time is more challenging since price change, prices change. But here we are only measuring the nominal value of goods sold over the re relevant period. Certainly, using labor hours is not as simple. 
An hour of skilled labor required to produce computer software is not the same as an hour of labor required to sweep the floors in the software firm. However, we can apply weights to labor hours to adjust for skills and education embodied in different types of work performed. While this is not an easy, uh, this is not easy. Our uh, official statisticians actually do con conduct calculations similar to this. In, in any event, in principle, we can weigh labor hours with an hour of skill labor equal to two hours over requiring lower skill levels. For example, even if in practice this is problematic, this would allow us to measure GDP in terms of weighted labor hours. A greater quantity of GDP would require a greater quantity of labor hours weighted by skill. For his exp exposition, Keynes used both the money value of spending and output and labor hours of input instead of price. Keynes used the total expected uh, proceed, pro uh, uh, proceeds across, uh, across all firms. Total proceeds are measured in money in terms and are expressed as function of employment See figure 13.1. And with that said, I'll be right back. Hey, welcome back. Uh, we again are on page 196, National Income Output and Employment Determination. And uh, instead of plotting quantity, Keynes used employment or the number of uh, labor hours employed. And if we assume that labor is weighted by skill and that each worker works a standard number of hours, then we can use the skill weighted number of workers rather than the number of hours worked as an uh, as our aggregate measure. Instead of the instead of the usual demand curve linking price and quality demanded, Keynes proposed the D curve that links expected pro, uh, proceeds to employment, uh, hence D represents the process, uh, proceeds, excuse me, expected from the employment of uh, N men. Um, obviously it is normal, uh, it normally has a pr uh, positive slope, there we go, uh, because an employment rises firms and aggregate will expect greater revenue from sales. Even if this might not be sh true for some firms, it will likely be true for all firms taken take it together. When employment is strong, expectation of sales revenues will be higher. Instead of the usual supply curve, link price and quantity produced, Keynes substitutes the Z curve again, Linked expected proceeds to employment Z is the expectation of process proceeds, which will make it worth the while uh, while uh, the um, uh, the inter, uh, in, entrepreneur uh, to give the employment uh, oh to give that employment excuse me uh, this is all this also slopes up because firms require higher expect a higher expected uh, revenue to reduce to induce them to hire more workers. What we need to keep in mind is that Keynes is proposing to replace market clearing equilibrium with his motion of effective demand. Firms will employ the number of workers such are workers that they need that they think they will need to produce the amount of output that they expect to sell at a, at a profit. They will hire more labor and produce more output if they think the sales revenue will be higher. This leads to a positive slope for the Z curve. The slope of the Z curve depends on the conditions of supply, and the rising slope indicates that in as, that as employment increases, from firms require that income rises faster than their employment costs. Firms can face resource bottlenecks as they expand output. Uh, beyond some point, as firms increase production, they find it more expensive to hire labor with just the right set of skills. They might have to pay more to purchase larger quantities of other crucial inputs from suppliers who face their own bottlenecks. 
When firms form the expectations that influence the amount of labor they choose to employ, they consider the condition they will face in hiring labor and purchasing the other means of production. When aggregate employment is high and labor markets are tight, they require higher expected proceeds. We thus expect the slope of the Z curve to increase as we move away from the origin due to perceived tightness and expected rise, rising costs and increased output. As we will as as we will discuss later in this section in this section, with more labor hired, there will be more wages generated, which might actually for, generate more sales revenue. It is the expectation that curve the D the uh, gives the D curve a position uh, a positive excuse me, slope. However, uh, here we here we need to emphasize that the D and the Z curves uh, concern expectations that influence the de uh, determination of employment at a point in time. Firms cannot know at the time they make their decision what the actual outcome will be. They might find that they are overly optimistic, profits are too low or non-existent, uh, or overly or overly uh, pessimistic. They could have sold more and reaped greater profits if they had employed more workers, or perhaps just right. The outcome, in turn, can affect their expectations in the future and hence uh, future employment decisions. Finally, we need to understand that D and Z curves are for economy uh, for the economy as a whole and do not represent demand and supply curve for individual market. Effectively, what we are doing is summar summing across summing across the uh, employment decision of all firms in the economy to find aggregate level of employment. Each firm hires up to the point where it employs the number of workers it needs to produce the amount of output it expects to sell at a profit. Taking into account expected revenue and expected costs at each level of employment. In chapter 15 and 16, we will discuss and uh, we will return to a more detailed discussion of the an analysis of aggregate demand and supply. Figure 13.1 depicts the uh, D through Z curves. The curves are represented as nonlinear functions, and we will discuss why they might be nonlinear. They are drawn for a given for a given money wage level of W, uh, W and O, or zero. However, the intersection of the two curves is labeled point A. This is the point effective demand, which is the aggregate level of employment consistent with the expectation that lie behind the employment decision of firms. To the left of uh, point A, the D curve lies about the uh, lies above the not about but above the Z curve. This means that at any point to the left of A, the expected proceeds from hiring the corresponding amount of employment is greater shown on D curve than the cost required by a firm to hire that amount of employment shown on the Z curve. In other words, D is greater than Z. Rational firms expect to increase revenue and profits by employing more workers. However, in the right point, A, the expected proceeds from hiring more workers are less than it is the outlay required to induce a firm to actually hire more people, or more since the Z curve lies above the, Z, uh, the D curve, Z is better than D. Rational firms will not employ more workers than they think they need to produce the amount of output they expect to sell prof profitability. Or, yeah, profitability. Right. Profitably. Anyway. Profitably. There we go. Profitably. Jeez. Okay. I did say from the very beginning that my, my reading is not very good. My reading may not be very good at times, but overall is better than what I had in the past. So there you go. We cannot, see, we cannot say for sure that all points to the right of, of a point, A, actual result, and losses to firms. All we can say is that the expected proceeds are below what they want to obtain from employ, employing the corresponding amount of, of labor. <clears throat> 
The equilibrium is at point A. Firms are employing the amount of labor that is expected to produce the expected revenue that are required to reduce or induce them to employ that amount of labor. We do not have to call employment the number of workers as the aggregate level that firms wish to employ given their expectations of sales. If they become or be, if they became more optimistic about sales, they would have they would have they would hire more. If they are more pessimistic, they would uh, hire fewer. But given the their expectations, point A is just right. Keynes called the point uh, a point the effective demand by that he meant that employing n uh, zero workers is shown on the horizontal axis is expected to produce the corresponding level of uh, proceeds or e zero shown on the vertical axis higher employment should or would excuse me to be would be expected to produce more income and hence higher demand. However, actual sales are expected to be below what firms require to employ more workers. Z is greater than D. Lower employment would be less desirable because expected revenues exceed required revenues. D is better is uh, is, high, is higher than Z, providing an incentive to increase employment. At uh, only at point A do we have. An equilibrium level of effective demand macroeconomic equilibrium thus occurs for the current given money wage rate of W at N, uh, which determines the employment in the economy. Thirteen point three, introducing two components of aggregate demand D and D two. And with that, I will be right back. Hey, welcome back. Uh, we are on 13.3, uh, 198, uh, which is the page, by the way, 198. Uh, introducing two components of aggregate demand, D1 and D2. Keynes divided, uh, yeah, divided aggregate demand D between uh, two categories, D1 and D2. D1 rises with employment and income. This is a normal associated with consumption, which is assumed to be a function of income and thus employment. On the other hand, D2 covers spending that is auto autonomous to employment and income. That means that the level of D2 does not tend to change when employment and income changes or change. Thus, the determinants of D2 are variables other than uh, employment and income. Haynes included investment and spending in this category. The reason, uh, the reason is this. Investment is a mostly a function of expected future profits. So it demands on, so it depends on what Keynes called the state of lo lo long-term expectations. While these expectations may be affected uh, in some degree by the current state of the economy, profits that are expected many months and years into the future will be the main influence on these long-term expectations. Consuming consumption is determined mostly by current uh, disposable income and the propensity to consume out of income. Further, the propensity to consume out of income is normally thought to be greater than zero, but less than one. This means that if income rises rises by a dollar, consumption changes by some positive amount, but by less than a dollar. As Keynes put it, the psychology of the community is such that when aggregate real income is increased, aggregate consumption is increased, but not by so much as income. Keynes goes on so to argue that the marginal propensity to consume falls as income rise. He says that the richest and the richer the community. And lower the propensity to consume, which he levels uh, he labels the fate of middle uh, Midas. We can 
presume that as employment rises, um, consumption rises because higher employment generates more income. And there is a fairly stable but slowly declining relation between an increase of employment and the rise of, in of uh, income generated by that employment and the propensity to consume associated with the change in, the, uh, in employment will be the pro product of the rise in income and the propensity to consume out of that income. This means that, D, that the D1 curve will have a positive but declining slope like the D curve in figure 13.1. Beyond some point, the slope will decline as the propensity to consume tends to fall as employment and income rise. This is often called uh, a demand gap. Uh, hiring more workers and paying them wages increases the average demand by but by less than the income that is paid out by employers. Note that all the wage income generated by employing workers represent a cost to the employers who employ, who employ those workers, and the aggregate employers can, cannot recover their additional wage expenses if newly uh, employed workers only spend a fraction of the wage they are paid. The argument applies mo uh, more generally to the to uh, to all incomes that are generated by the exp expansion of production, wages, profits, or rents. If the propensity to spend out of the, out of that new income is less than one. In other words, not all of the additional in income generated by higher production will be spent on consumption. These cost of production that is the income that is paid in the form of wages, profits, and rents during the production process underpin the Z curve since they are cost since they are costs that need to be recovered to reduce producers uh, to induce producers to employ workers to produce a particular level of output they would be no uh, there would there would be no equilibrium point of effective demand if there was only spending on consuming uh, consumption d1 because expected cost the main de dominant determinant of these proceeds required to uh, induce entrepreneurs to employ workers would exceed expectation or expected revenues from the employment that is from the sale of output is to satisfy D1. So long as the propensity to consume out of income is less than one, this is the demand this is the demand gap. What about D2? Since by assumption D2 is not a function of employment or income, it will, it will if we were to graph it, in figure 13.1, it would be depicted as a horizontal line. D2 is associated with investment in the means of production, but it can include government purchases as well as the export demand, which might depend on employment abroad, but is unlikely to be associated with domestic employment. We add D2 to D1 to obtain the total aggregate demand shown at the D curve on in figure 13.1. D2 can fill the demand gap as long as it as long as it is positive. We can we have already said that the point of effective demand occurs when the D curve meets the Z curve. Given expectations is the only possible point the firms employ the number of workers they think they need to produce the output they think they can profit, profitably sell. And figure 30.1 at point A, we find that D1 plus D2, D2 is equal to Z. It is at this point the point of effective demand that the aggregate expected proceeds D equals D1 plus D2 equal the proceeds Z that are required to induce firms to hire just the amount of labor canes referred to as uh, refer to this model at the as the general theory of employment in chapter 15 we we will present a more detailed discussion of the components of aggregate demand and will frame the opposite the exposition in terms of aggregate income rather than aggregate employment this is the method usually adopted by economists today and is more consistent with the nat national income and, pr and product as a accord, accord, excuse me, account method methodology. 
We discussed in, ch in chapter four, uh, however, Kane's goal in developing the D through Z framework was to show how the equilibrium level of employment is determined without references to a labor market in which flexible wages are claimed to function to clear the market. Keynes emphasized that the point of effective demand need not correspond to full employment. 13.4, the advantages of the D, Z, D, D through Z framework. The D through Z framework developed by Keynes has several benefits if we are addressing the economy as a whole. First, employers make production decisions based on expectations of nominal uh, proceeds. Our supply curve Z is forward looking. Unlike the supply curve in the market for bananas at 1659 on Saturday, which represents a past supply decisions and sales earlier in the day, the Z curve represents the expectations of suppliers looking forward in time to the period in which they will undertake production. The Z curve shows the different level of revenues proceeds they, that must be generated to induce firms to hire the corresponding number of workers. Firms also hold expectations about the sales and hence revenues that will be forthcoming from different levels of employment, shown on the D curve. These expectations will be mediated by actual macroeconomic outcomes. If firms have underestimated revenues and hired too few workers production, producing too little output, then the inventory will be run down. For example, retail stores will find that they cannot keep sufficient stock on hand to meet customer demand, so the shelves begin to empty. The stores place new orders with suppliers, who in turn place orders with manufacturers. And manufacturers believe the higher demand will be sustained, the increased employment and output. In terms of uh, figure 13.1, the D curve show, uh, shifts out and point of the Shifts, uh, shifts out and the point of effective demand will go to the rights uh, to the rights of to the right of point A. There you go. On the other hand, if employers if employers uh, had overestimated revenues and the inventories pile up and retailers reduce orders, producers find that they are producing too much and might reduce employment. If they think the sales slump will continue, the point of effective demand shifts left in figure 13.1. We emphasize that the D through Z framework is a, to is a tool that we as economists can use to think about the determination of employment at the aggregate level of the economy. Individual firms do not use the framework to determine or yeah, determine their own level of employment except for the bigger for the biggest firm firms, the impact of a firm's higher decision on the aggregate level of employment and spending can be ignored. While large firms certainly do not have departments of, that forecast aggregate demand for use of planning in planning production of their range of products, smaller firms focus more on their own individual situation. As macroeconomic and macro, macroeconomists, we are principally concerned with the determination of total employment and output. We also recognize the employment decision of individual firms impact on the sales experienced by other firms. Thus, if we if the sum of employment decisions made by individuals firm individual firms lead to more employment, then aggregate sales will be expected to be higher as a produ as production. Decisions are modified over the course of a year. Using the D through Z analysis allows us to take into account the inter, inter independent independence of the demands and suppliers or supplies, as well as the impacts of a production decision of one market on another. The macroeconomic demand for labor. The D through Z framework enables the derivation. Derivation, derivation, yeah, uh, and the macroeconomic demand for labor schedule as a function of the money, of the money which a complete treatment can be found in chapter 14. And we just provide some introductory comments here. Let me make sure I got the derivation and derivation, I guess. Anyway. 
uh, the money wage impacts both the supply and the demand sides of the economy. A change in the money wage changes unit labor costs at the time at the fir at the firm level, which in turn affects the industry supply curve and thus shifts the aggregate Z, Z function. At each employment level, a, ri a rise in the money wage will push the Z function up because the firm now requires more sales revenue to sustain the same uh, employment and output level levels to satisfy their profit expectations. But a higher money wage also means that at each employment level, the minimum uh, the nominal excuse me, uh, incomes paid out are higher, and this stimulates a nominal ag aggregate demand in the first instance via higher uh, aggregate consumption. Therefore, the Z function shifts up when the money wage rises because firms will expect higher sales revenues and shifts down of the uh, of the oh, shifts down if the money wage is cut in expectation of lower sales revenues the point of effective demand will thus be sensitive uh, sensitive to the magnitude of money wage this is this in turn sets the level of employment that firms will offer and the level of output and national income generated by the economy we can draw a family of aggregate D uh, and Z functions and points of effective demand corresponding to different level, um, different money level wages, uh, different wage levels. There we go. This allows us to relate each money wage level with the particular points, uh, point of effective demand and aggressive or uh, uh, aggregate employment. The importance of the recognition that changes and changing wages cause both the D and the and a Z curve to shift to what ca what caused Keynes rejected classical theory of employment, which considered the marginal productivity function to define the the macroeconomic labor demand function without reference to the goods and service market services market. The approach adopted by Keynes and those who follow him uh, situated the de uh, deriva derivation of the macroeconomic labor demand function uh, in the goods of services and market by ex ex examining how money wage movements influence the po point of effective demand. Thus, when considering a change of money wages, we must take account not only of the impact on the supply side, but also of the impact on the demand side of the goods and services market. What this means is that we must reject the simple classical labor market approach, which claims that employment is determined by an upward sloping labor supply curve, downward sloping labor demand curve, and a flexible wage, real wage that assures full employment. And the approach is con inconsistent with the recognition that the outcome in the labor market is dependent on firms' expectations about the proceeds to be generated from employment that's, that is aggregate spending. 13.5, the role of saving and liquidity preferences. We'll be right back. Uh, welcome back. We are 13.5, the role of saving and liquidity preference. In classical theory, it was assumed that one, uh, when one chooses not to spend one's income on current consumption, that is, save, that, it, that it is to save income. That is a matched by that is matched by a decision to spend on investment, which will produce output to be consumed in the future. This is why Say's law holds since the decision to save it match by a decision and invest uh, to invest. They cannot therefore be a demand gap. All income always gets spent neither on consumption uh, consumption goods or invest or investments, investment goods. And we can say that supply creates its own demand. 
Keynes argued that this relationship is false. A decision to save does not automatically generate a decision to invest. It might be true that an individual's decision to save is a decision to postpone consumption. However, that individual can postpone consumption by saving in the form of money or financial assets, which are liquid rather than by placing an order for goods and services to be provided at a particular time in the future. This is why saving typically opens up a demand gap. Keynes argues that in the real world, there is a preference for liquidity, a desire to accumulate uh, holdings of liquid assets such as money and financial assets. This preserves options since an, an individual who holds money can decide later when and where and what to consume. If one is uncertain about the future, it makes sense to save in a liquid form. According to Keynes, this makes a big difference to our analysis of the ag aggregate economy. Uncertainty lies behind both the D and the Z curves. Firms form their expectations about demand for their output while realizing that their best guesses can turn out to be wrong. If their uncertainty is too great, they have the option of foregoing hiring and curtailing production. Most importantly, if they are pessimistic about the future, they can decide to hold off investing in plant and equipment, just as the household has the option of holding money and financial assets. The firm has the option of purchasing financial assets rather than invest investment goods that will have impact on the D2 curve because spending on capital goods generates employment and effective demand. On the other hand, the purchase of financial assets might create a few jobs in the financial services sector, but this will not affect, offset all the jobs lost in the investment sector, goods sector. For these reasons, a, desired, a desire to postpone consumption can reduce D1 without increasing D2, which creates the demand gap. Thus, labor displaced from producing goods is to satisfy D1 does not find jobs producing the output and in, in, includes included in the D2. Okay, so I misread that, or at least I misunderstood that when I first read it. It says in classical theory, it was assumed. I was thinking that I was saying that Sage was right. Anyway, uh, 13.6 demand gap argument and policy applications. From the previous sections, we understood we understand that expected D1 spending at any given level of employment will generally fall short of what is necessary to draw forth the supply or shown on the Z curve corresponding to the level of employment. This demand gap needs to be fulfilled by D2 spending for to produce a point of effective demand. At, the, at that level of employment, so far we have restricted our analysis to investment spending uh, as a component of D2 spending. We have also noted that because investment spending depends on expectations of firms concern, uh, concerning future profits to, make, uh, to be made from additional plant and equipment, there is no assurance that investment will be high not to fill a particular demand gap. However, there are two other kinds of spending that we need to consider government spending, wait, to, to consider. Government spending and net exports. These can also reduce the demand gap. Let us first deal with net exports. As we will discuss in chapter 15, exports represent a, a leakage out of the domestic economy. If consumers spend income on foreign-produced foreign goods and services, this reduced domestic demand. A portion of imports could be considered to be somewhat independent of domestic income, while, they, while a significant portion is considered to be a function of domestic income. This means that imports would affect both the D1 and D2 curves, which would shift the D curve down in, uh, in figure 13.1, adding to the demand gap. As domestic income rises, the demand for imports rises. 
this propensity to import might even increase as income rises uh, rises again since more purport, uh, imported luxury consumption goods might be demanded. On the other hand, exports add to domestic demand uh, because foreigners purchase goods and services produced domestically. Export demand is rel relative, uh, relatively de independent of domestic income. Hence, exports show up primarily in D2 curve. Net export are defined as exports less imports. If, if, pos if positive net imp exports mean that D2 will be higher, helping to close d a demand gap. All else being equal, this means the point of effective demand in figure 13.1 will be further out to the right with a higher level of employment. This is why nations often pursue a strategy of promoting net exports by raising aggregate demand through exports, the level of effective demand is higher and that generates more employment. Obviously, it is possible for all nations to actually run positive net exports at the same time. It is a zero sum or impossible. Sorry, I thought it was, I thought it was possible. Uh, it is impossible. Uh, it is zero sum, uh, wait, zero sum game. Globally exports, uh, globally exports uh, must uh, equal imports. The strategy of promoting net exports to close demand gaps is called um, mercantilism. Okay, uh, it is a bigger it is a bigger the thy neighbor policy because those nations that succeed do so at the expense of other nations and that end up with the trade deficits. As Keynes pointed out, it leads to international hostility, including trade wars and even trade and even to war. There is an alternative strategy that does not pit nation against nation, another source of demand in government spending or fiscal policy more generally. Let us first consider uh, tax policy and then move to government spending. Spending or fiscal policy, more generally, let us first, oh wait, I already ignored that. We have so far ignored taxes, but it is clear that taxes will reduce the spending of the private sector. Taxes primarily hits consumers and, and so reduce the D1 portion of spending. Many taxes rise with income. Others, uh, other taxes are not directly related to household income and some impact on business and investment decisions in that case. They might lower the D2 type of spending. Government can reduce the demand gap by lowering taxes. However, this can be a rather blunt instrument because reducing taxes does not, in, in direct, does not directly increase demand. To be effective, the tax cuts need to increase the willingness of a household and firms to spend on domestic output. If the, ta if the tax cuts lead to increased savings, uh, uh, increased saving or paying down debt or higher imports, they do not stimulate domestic demand. Only if the tax cuts induce spending on domestic output, will they raise demand by increasing D1 and, and or D2. Increasing government spending can only can only uh, can also be used to fill da uh, demand gaps, and because government spending can be direct uh, toward can be directed towards the domestic demand, it is a, a, a it is a powerful policy instrument. Let us consider three alternative approaches. First, government can purchase domestic output direct directly from domestic producers by ordering goods and services. Government adds to demand and generates employment in the private sector. This is represented in Figure 13.1 as an upward sh uh, shift of the D2 curve, pushing the point of effective demand where the D curve crosses the curve, uh, the Z curve out to the right. Employment and out and output are higher. Second, government can uh, second government can increase transfer payments to households. This could be in the form of higher unemployment of compensation, welfare, or social security payments. For example, this would this will stimulate consumption by households. However, as in the case of tax cut of a tax cut, there is no guarantee that households will increase their spending on domestic output. The impact on dem on demand for domestic output will depend on, on what those who uh, receive. And transfer payments decide to do with it. 
some of the increased transfer payments will leak out of the economy through higher savings and more imports and higher taxes. Still, it is very likely to that likely that if trans transfers can target the households with low income, consumption will rise and D1 curve will shift up, generating more employment and greater domestic production. Finally, yeah, finally, government can direct, uh, directly hire the unemployed. This will directly increase employment and generate more household income. Again, that is a that is likely to generate more household consumption, shifting the D1 curve up. This is a well-known notion behind the government spending multiplier, which was in Chapter 15, for a formal treatment treatment yeah treatment <laughs> of the multiplier there will also be some leakage uh, leakages to imports and saving and taxes but the net impact will be to raise employment directly and consumption we must close the section with the caveat caveat however recall from previous sections that d curve as well as is comp uh Components D1 and D2 is framed in terms of expectations from firm from higher firms higher labor based on the expectations of sales. In this section, we have discussed various injections and leakages that come from the investment, government, and foreign sectors. There can they can these can help to close or open up the demand gap created by propensity to a consume which is presumed to be less than one. We need to remember, however, that what ma matters for what matters what matters for the determination of the point of effective demand is expected revenues were relative to cost. If an announced government policy of tax cuts or of a spending increases were to raise sales expectations of employers, the point of effective demand would be further out to the right, indicating a higher level of employment. However, it is possible to conceive of a situation in which the expectations of employers do not uh, do not react in a positive manner to such an announce, uh, announcement. Maybe they do not believe it, or maybe they expect negative consequences, inflation that that raises costs more than expected revenue or monetary policy tightening. In that case, they may not employ more workers. The point of effective demand is not farther to the right. The point is that we should not view these D and Z curves as conceptual devices that we can shift about in a mechanical fashion uh, to fine tune the economy. Rather, they are an analytical devices that help us to understand how the aggregate level of employment and output is determined. Conclusion. In this chapter, we have examined uh, examined Kane's exp uh, exposition of the theory of effective demand by making sh use of his D and Z curve. These relate employment to the point of effective demand. Keynes approached approach taking account of the fact that employment affects income and output and hence affects the demand for which workers generally a greater Employment leads to greater sales. The higher the point of effective demand, the greater level of employment and the greater the expected sales. Keynes D through Z framework provides us with an alternative to the classical labor market analysis. Rather than determining the aggregate level of employment in the labor market through a independent labor demand, and supply curves, as classical theory does, Keynes argued that aggregate employment is determined at a, at any uh, given level by points uh, by the point of effective demand. The D and Z curve expo uh, exposition also uh, provides advantages over the typical aggregate demand and aggregate supply curve, which relates some output to aggregate price level. First, the, tra the traditional aggregate demand supply model, aggregates up from the micro level, presuming independence of the two curves, while the, the demand supply analysis might be 
applying for a local market for bananas late on a Sunday afternoon, it is not appropriate to assume that supply and demand are independent for the economy as a whole. Since the supply of output affects employment and income, a, a must affect demand change took this in, uh, uh, independent uh, into independence into account by posing by position by position by posi I guess pos positing uh, that the point of maybe position anyway uh, points of affected demand depends on the level of sales expected. As a function of level employment, firms then hire amount of labor they they need to produce the opposition. There we go. Uh, produce the amount of output they think they can sell. Keynes rejects Sage's law, the, pro the proposition that supply create creates its own demand because the income that is generated in the production process or supply does not have and uh, does not have to be spent or demand. One can save part of one's income in the liquid form of financial assets rather than purchasing outcome. This opens the possibility of a demand gap at the at any given level of employment. That is, supply is greater than demand. Keynes' method allows us to see how it is possible for aggregate spending to be equal to aggregate demand. Uh, aggregate income, excuse me, which is necessary necessarily true at the aggregate level without invoking Say's law. As the point of effective demand, the income that is generated by production uh, production sub or supply is expected to equal the sale that will result from employing more workers to produce it or demand, the produce it or demand. However, Keynes insisted that the point of effective demand need not to be consistent with the full employment. Indeed, the point of effective demand could be consistent with any level of employment. One must not forget the important point that Keynes are D through seven or D through seven <laughs> D through Z. Excuse me. Framework is under underpinned by expectations. The Point of effective demand, point A in figure 13.1, is an equi equilibrium where the level of employment is consistent with the level of aggregate proceeds that satisfy two conditions. That these are the proceeds that are expected to be generated from precisely that level of employment, uh, and they are the proceeds that are required by firms to employ precisely the, that number of workers. However, it will be a mistake to jump to conclusion that the level of employment consisted with the point of effective demand, uh, or N, uh, N0, and being a, uh, and point A in figure 13.1. will actually generate the level of sales expected to other, in other words, our di diagram is X ante showing what is expected rather than X pose showing what actually happens with uh, respect to sales. It does not, it does, excuse me, it does show how much employment will be offered by producers in the aggregate. Sales might turn out to be higher than expected, great, or lower, lower than expected, which is disappointing. The outcome might then cause firms to exchange their expectations, leading to a different point of effective demand in the next period. The level of employment consistent with their new expectations it could be higher or lower, uh, lower, lower than the equilibrium or N. Hence, the point of effective demand and thus employment will likely change as we move through time, depending in part of, wh of whether expectation, expectations turn out to be validated. Expectations can also be changed by policy pronouncements by government, a new spending program, or changes to taxes, for example, the opening of new market of markets abroad, new te to, new technolo technological, I can never pronounce that word right, anyways, innovation, uh, I'll just say tech, new tech uh, innovation, uh, discoveries of new natural resources and other such events can also change the state of expectations and hence the point of effective demand. Now Monday, because I will be on tomorrow. Now Monday, I will be doing Chapter 14, the Macroeconomic Demand for Labor. 
if you like if you liked what this episode was was about and you liked my reading despite the flubbing the the flubbing of a lot of words uh please consider subscribing to this channel commenting on this channel liking the channel uh hitting the bell for more notification of more content for this channel and please remember to go to growprogressive.org if you want uh shows like macroeconomics or and i'm sorry you've seen macroeconomics macro and cheese um also a lot of great articles on that on that website as well as merchandise and other things uh, or you can also go to youtube and say and see macro and cheese on there as well also luke Par uh, uh, parker show um and uh steve grumbine's uh the work scholar and on uh, status Ku, he does a he kind of co-hosts a show with uh jordan sheridan as well as does a interview slash uh, opinion show uh called the uh, get ready to grumble um and also just a lot of other things going on as far as real progressive in action on youtube and check him out also on uh twitter uh yeah anyway so uh thanks for uh listening uh we'll see you monday uh, or you will hear me monday hopefully uh but again please subscribe to this channel support this channel with uh comments with the like with the uh with ringing the bell um yeah and uh sharing that's most important sharing and subscribing pretty much uh thanks for listening have a good weekend and i'll talk to you monday peace out for now